Thank you for coming. I'm Matthew Dunn. You've probably discerned that I'm an MFA candidate for Emerging Media, Studio Art and Design. Um, want to thank, first of all, my cohort for being just generally great people and for putting their acknowledgments up front so that I can, you know, make sure everyone gets the, the our supporters get the attention they deserve. So I want to thank my committee, Chuck Abraham, Victor Davila, Kerry Watson for their time and attention. And uh, Chuck and Victor in particular have been mentors for more than 20 years. Um, and other faculty mentors and the audience who I've known for at least as long. Um, I want to thank the gallery staff for their expertise and help in installation. It was a breeze, thanks to them. And I want to thank our program coordinator, Jason Burrell, whose uh, knowledge and concern for the students in this school is remarkable. <laughs> and lastly, a big thanks to my wife and my parents who uh, picked up a lot of the slack as my studies added um, a lot to an already very busy schedule. <laughs> there you go. Suddenly we're not moving. <laughs> oh, you know what happened is my keyboard died. That's fun. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm going to delve into a few of my recent research, my recent projects. I'm going to talk about my decisions regarding materials and techniques and imagery. Most of my works are intended to be appreciated by a fairly broad audience, and my finished works emphasize polish and accessibility. Humor is also very important in my work. My process is about problem solving, and I typically strive to make images that are well suited to a variety of outlets in print and on screen. That will probably seem unsurprising as I share a little of my history. I have an extensive background in the graphic arts. Thanks to high school electives and my mother's career in publishing, my experience in the field goes back nearly 30 years. I was exposed to a variety of pre-digital processes and equipment, and that underpins my work even to today on paper and on the computer. I really treasure my analog experience, and I think it had a tremendous um, influence on my compositional skills and my attention to detail. I earned my bachelor's in art with the specialization in graphic design, and I have maintained a full-time career in the field while also working as a freelance designer and illustrator. I've worked with a wide variety of clients, from startups to ad agencies, working on products including poster art, logo design, packaging, environmental concepts, magazines, brochures, vehicle wraps, spot illustration, um, and with that backdrop, I joined the MFA program on a part-time basis uh, quite a few years ago. I had no gray hair at the time. And uh, I've been looking to build my skill set and pursue more personal projects. It gave me motivation and mentorship, and I was able to explore themes and subjects, styles, materials that I might not have tackled in my professional work. In a few cases, I was able to build on existing professional opportunities, taking extra time in my studies to experiment and to suit my personal and academic goals. Portraiture and comics have been my primary avenues of exploration. You're going to see some instances where they overlap. In the spirit of my client work, I tailor my approach to each project, choosing my materials and my rendering style based upon the content. I've challenged myself to work in new ways, drawing upon divergent styles. Many times I'm emulating or building upon well-known icons and genres. I've worked with ink, scratchboard, watercolor, marker, and some watercolor, gouache, paper, digital painting, vector graphics, and often those are inspired by silkscreen methods. Um, sure West has a book about portraiture, and it's aptly titled Portraiture, and it has a survey of nearly 150 of the most famous portraits in art history. It's a really engaging and interesting book relevant to my interests, um, but I was also interested in her discussion of the ways that we can uh, convey likeness in portraits, and it's not just physical resemblance, but um, character traits, status of the subject, psychological states, allegory, and how they fit in or contrast with their milieu. And that sort of thematic approach is usually as important to me as the materials and the resemblance of the subject. Here we have one where I'm portraying Zora Neale Hurston in association with the Harlem Renaissance. I'm using imagery from the painting of Aaron Douglas, famous painter from that era, some of the specific um, 
icons of the sort of shapes that he uses in his paintings. I've depicted John Steinbeck, rendered in the setting of his most famous works in the Dust Bowl. Denal Mengesu, who writes about immigrant communities in the US, is situated within the context of recent massive global migration. A few years ago in this program, I collaborated with one of my fellow MFA candidates. I created a poster for her documentary film called 83 Orange Peels. The poster depicts the subject of the film, a man who was imprisoned in Syria for his criticism of the government. The film's title references an orange that was served with this sparse meal that he received each day of his imprisonment. Um, he spent much of his imprisonment garbed only in his underwear. I created the drawings with ink wash and graphite, and I knew that I could achieve some of the lighting effects with uh, greater precision and without having to resort to airbrush by working digitally. So I took those three drawings. We have two portraits and then some scribble texture that were composited digitally. And it's intended to evoke isolation and the interrogation under harsh lighting. And I've overlaid those scratchy marks in order to create an agitated energy. John Prine is one of my favorite artists. Um, this portrait was a bit of a departure for me in terms of style and process. I did it in March of 2020 when his diagnosis with COVID-19 was made public. And knowing his personal history with illness, it seemed like really dire. And indeed, he died a few days later. And because I wanted to complete this image very quickly, I worked in Procreate. It's supposed to be playing in a time lapse. There we go. Worked in Procreate on an iPad to mimic watercolors. And of course, the digital platform allows me to quickly generate ideas and to roll back mistakes. But as it turned out, I really didn't do a whole lot of undo with this particular piece. And the work was completed in under two hours. It was just one of those like magical sessions where you feel like the, it's flowing through your pen. And, um, but even still, because I was working on the iPad, I think I felt more loosened to you know, play around with a little bit of slight caricature and the, cold, the colors get a little bit more bold than are typical in my pieces. And it sort of reminded me of David Hockney's approach to digital art and that he really prizes the speed of iteration and the fact that the device makes us bolder. This portrait has at least two features in common with the John Prine portrait. Again, I worked digitally to try to mimic traditional painting. And I also created it on a single night, which has particular relevance to the subject. I painted this on the evening of January 6, 2021. And so accordingly, it lacks a lot of the playfulness in my other work. And though it's realistic in many respects, the work is not actually about depicting Trump himself. It's inspired by his supporters who refuse to acknowledge his fatal defects. By supporting persons who openly reject the values that we profess to hold, we cut off our nose despite our face. I wanted the image to appear dramatic and foreboding. Uh, using multiple reference photos, I created this close-up composite portrait, and I rendered most of his head, uh, the surrounding of his head in a, a deep shadow to sort of draw your attention to his missing nose. I used a lot of loose and sketchy dry strokes, and the impression is to, intended to be hazy and a little bit uncertain, and I heightened the saturation in his irises to make it more of an icy stare. Southern strategy is a denunciation of Trump's behavior and rhetoric, and it borrows its title from the Republican efforts to lure Southern whites away from the Democratic Party in the mid 20th century by exploiting racial tension. My piece echoes a common assertion that Trump consciously leveraged racial animosity and it predicted that this approach would ultimately sink his campaign. The president is depicted using a uh, a parachute emblazoned with the embarrassingly persistent rebel flag, and the Confederate flag parachute is burning to shreds while an unwitting or unbothered president tweets incendiary comments from his smartphone. Once again, working with an iPad and a stylus, I was able to easily create fine lines and wispy hair and plumes of smoke. Fire rises from the corner of the parachute with its form and color appearing almost as an overblown repetition of Trump's billowing comb over. Southern strategy is presented in a format consistent with many single panel political cartoons. I avoided looking at specific cartoons during the production of this image, but these are a few of the examples of the kind of work that I was trying to channel. Classic <coughs> newspaper cartoons and legendary illustrators like Jack Davis.
This image was conceived in March of 2023 um, after an escalation in the public feud between the Walt Disney Company and Ron DeSantis, which was very antagonistic, is, and featured a lot of cartoonish grandstanding by our governor. The scene references Disney's low-key yet public effort to circumvent state takeover of its special governing district. The event was an embarrassment for DeSantis as his team was caught flat-footed. My comic mocks the governor's fixation with culture war wedge issues while depicting Disney's corporate mascot as a sneaky, fiendish character. Though executed digitally using Procreate, the image is presented as a single frame of traditional animation. I use digital gouache style brushes so that the background resembles hand-painted scenery. The main characters are drawn with simple dark outlines and appear to be painted in flat colors on celluloid. The effect is enhanced by a subtle drop shadow as well as faint dust and scratches applied in Photoshop. I included elements from one of Disney's other rivals as uh, Mickey here is presented in the role of Bugs Bunny from Looney Tunes. DeSantis faces a literal downfall due to his obsession with drag performance. I spend a little extra time trying to capture the right length for our governor's gender non-conforming heels. <laughs> My highly rendered illustration is in fact a rather inefficient approach to political cartooning which requires a quick turnaround uh, in order for timely publication. But I feel like this one is a fresh and colorful addition to my collection of atypical political cartoons. In these projects, I'm able to respond to troubling news stories with joyful expression while stretching the boundaries of the form. Stepping back in time a bit, I made this silk screen in 2008. It is probably my first work of religious and political satire and it's connected to many of my later works in terms of imagery and theme. It's a, and also intent. It's a timely sight gag and it has a double meaning. I created it during the housing bubble crisis. And like the noseless Trump portrait, this image is clearly not meant to be a portrait of a historical Jesus. For starters, he could not have been a tall white guy. Rather, it satirizes religious, political, and commercial institutions that associate themselves with the gospel while demonstrating few, if any, of Christ's values. I chose the bright colors and halftones, and especially the method of screen printing, for its connection to consumerism and 20th century pop art. If I'd known I'd been this close to the piece, I would have worn my white suit and my 80s televangelist glasses. Uh, for this one, I created a devotional piece exalting my wife and children. They quite literally light up the room, a manifest dad joke. It's designed to resemble classic stained glass church windows. And I was faced with a lot of unfamiliar production challenges, and I worked with a variety of new materials to create a reasonable facsimile of stained glass without devoting significant funds and years of effort adopting traditional techniques. I actually started this work at the birth of my first child, but professional commitments interrupted, and so I revisited it at the birth of our second child. I started with a meticulous, nearly full-scale ink on paper drawing. I applied ink wash shading to approximate vitreous paint. I built the design of the lead cames and the ornamental elements um, in vector art. It was colored with a restricted palette, which echoes the limitations of vintage stained glass. And I weathered it digitally and printed on transparent film. That print is mounted between clear acrylic sheets and a custom built light box and LED strips are running around the interior of the frame. The infant is wrapped in a pink and blue striped blanket that is ubiquitous in US maternity wards. And the mother, my spouse, is cloaked in a bright blue which can signify royalty or holiness in medieval art. My oldest child holds up two fingers, a literal reference to her age at the time of the portrait. And it also evokes similar gestures of benediction and the Holy Trinity in Christian art. The human figures are flanked at each corner by our family pets. The winged cats in the upper corners had recently passed away. I painted a variety of background options, including trees and rays of lights, but I ultimately settled on this um, blue cloudy sky painted in horizontal strokes to suggest the swift passage of joyful times. The ornamental borders include floral patterns adapted from an assortment of church windows, and they're surrounded by heart-shaped icons that provide a winking contemporary embellishment. I have been asked on several occasions why I didn't include a self-portrait, and I like to joke that as artist and father, I've assumed the role of creator. <laughs> The, the real answer, however, is a little bit different and that it doesn't match the sort of images that I wanted to parody. And I think of the image to be a veneration of motherhood while rejecting the religious patriarchal requirement of virginity. 
my satisfaction with the image would lead me to put it on the front of our Christmas cards that year, and it led to a series of family portraits in a succession of styles. I decided to follow Madonna and children with another religiously inspired form family portrait. Our family had expanded, so I developed a nativity scene with our newborn daughter at the center. We used this one on the greeting card as well that year. Um, it's inspired by blow mold lawn ornaments, the kitschy plastic decorations that have been a staple of Christmas time for decades. I understand they're making a bit of a comeback. And it capitalizes on holiday nostalgia and classic Western portrayals of Christ's birth story. As in the previous work, loved ones supplant religious icons as venerated figures, and light plays an important role. I worked more explicitly here with the theme of illumination. The infant is nestled in a modern car seat on the grass between her parents' feet, while the older siblings and family pets stand in for wise men and angels. Some people have asked if I actually produced these figures. And as with the stained glass piece, I did not attempt to replicate the original materials, though I have some experience with mold making and rotocasting on a very small scale. Creating the full size figures would have required a lot of material and space. It would have been molding and mother molding, and then space to cast those and airbrush and light them. And I wanted to get the work finished, and I didn't want my wife to kick me out of the house over the mess, so I completed it digitally, strictly digitally. <laughs> Almost strictly digitally. Um, I sketched each person, which I then traced in vector shapes. I softened the features, and I simplified or exaggerated some of the aspects based on vintage mold, blow mold figures. I built the likenesses with the dozens of layers that I exported to Photoshop, which allowed me to carefully select areas of the figure to build three-dimensional form with shading effects. And actually, the the cats are borrowed from photographs of real mass-produced figures that are then edited to have the markings of our cats. <laughs> Didn't have to make those from scratch. I applied color with digital airbrushing tools, adjusting the spread and texture to replicate the often imprecise or haphazard paint application on mass-produced blow molds. You can see, if you look really closely, the, how I've tried to mimic the particulars of how the um, paint doesn't enter the grooves in the, in the sculpt and so forth. Finally, I used a variety of Photoshop effects to create a variant portrait where the figures appear to glow. To create a convincing background for my computer-generated figurines, I positioned a camera, a digital camera, on a tripod in our yard. Instead of recording video, which would require me to remove background vehicles and bystanders, I captured still images every 15 minutes over the course of a few hours. I used Adobe After Effects to create the appearance of a time-lapse video. As nightfall looms, the figures begin to glow. And I created that for a variety of aspect ratios as well, so it would work on Instagram, it would work on a television. It does get a little bit darker, but I don't have to wait around for it, I suppose. The third image in this series dispenses with religious iconography, and it takes inspiration from other cherished holiday characters. Holiday Special depicts our family in the form of stop-motion puppets borrowing specifically from the animated programs produced by Rankin Bass in the 1960s and beyond. My materials and process were largely unchanged from the nativity piece, and once again, I was avoiding the cost and time-intensive construction methods from my source of inspiration. I worked from sketches to vector forms to densely layered Photoshop files, carefully crafting, crafting likenesses that looked like they could walk off the screen from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Much of the hair was composited and modified from actual family photos with some meticulous cleanup, and extra effort was spent on my facial hair so that it follows the pattern of the bearded characters on screen like Santa Claus. And as you can see, this is before the gray hair again. I rendered the anatomy to reflect the articulation of puppets. The background is composited from screenshots from the original programs, and I used a variety of cloning and digital airbrushing techniques to replicate the shimmering powdery snow. In 2022, I adapted the illustration and storytelling style of Dr. Seuss. For the first time, the artwork was designed around the greeting card. I established the format of the card and then generated copy and illustrations to fit the layout. I carefully replicated Seuss's frenetic and somewhat loose drawing style. My drawings specifically referenced set pieces, hatching techniques, color choices, and print methods from Cat in the Hat and How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I wrote a series of rhymes that attempt to replicate the rhythm and imagery found in Seuss's texts. The copy is present, presented in century typeface, which closely matches the aforementioned books. Shaped by my interest in graphic narrative, the completed card features six panels across two sides with accordion-style folding. It's presented in three colors, and each color appears in a limited set of values consistent with some of those early Seuss books. 
I illustrated the cover with a bit more sophistication, introducing brown by allowing green to overlap red. This technique was also inspired by book covers from Seuss that sometimes featured more developed color than in the interiors. These family greeting cards have provided a lot of motivation and outlet for my portraits, and they have a social function. They're unique gifts that share my humor, my pride and my affection, and my artwork, and they're also autobiographical. They are snapshots of a sort, and they document more than my art making experience. For example, my two youngest children still don't like to wear clothes around the house. As I was delving into graphic narrative and using parody and satire, it seemed inevitable that I would return to classic adventure comics. Comic books and graphic novels, especially superhero stories, were integral, integral to my development as an artist. I consumed stores of them and practiced drawing directly from their pages. Uh, my son recently, I actually was six years old, and he asked my mother, he had a comic book in his hand, and he said, you should love daddy more than comics, right? I think so. And <laughs> proof that the apple did not fall too far from the tree. Blow Up the Moon is also the most collaborative piece to come out of my MFA work. I adapted a story by David K. Gibson, who also happens to be a recent graduate of UCF's creative writing MFA program. He's an accomplished writer whose work has appeared in McSweeney's and in HarperCollins anthologies. He recently published one of my favorite works of short fiction titled The Book of Intracticus, The Second Person to Be Swallowed by a Whale. Blow Up the Moon is an eight page mad scientist parody that lampoons obsession, greed, and monetary policy. The events play, take place in the 1990s and the present day, but the art is rendered in a manner that evokes American comics of the late 60s and early 70s. I chose that period of comics to reflect my own interests, but also the story's supervillain motif and the protagonist's obsession with the past. The artwork was created with a mix of traditional and digital methods. I created thumbnail drawings on newsprint before polishing some of that work on an iPad. At this stage, I worked with the author to review panel structure and imagery for pacing and clarity. My references include superhero, sci-fi, and spy comics of the era, especially artists like Jack Kirby, Neil Adams, Wally Wood, and Jim Steranko. I created the final black and white artwork in a typical vintage comic style. I inked half of the pages with brush pens and technical pens on paper. The remaining pages were inked digitally. I did that for expedience because I did some of the work on vacation um, with the iPad, and I also wanted to see how closely I could merge those two styles. Um, the traditional and the digital line work, and I think they pair quite neatly. The pages are also digitally colored in a style that is consistent with 50-year-old comics. They are built in layers of magenta, cyan, and yellow halftones with blend modes that give the appearance of printing on aged newsprint. The color separations are intentionally off-register, mimicking the low fidelity printing of vintage comics and I've applied additional imperfections such as ink bleed, dropout, and paper discoloration. And in the final version, I also re-lettered some of the uh, computer-generated type in order for it to not look too perfect. To emphasize emotional states of the lead character, many of the panels are restricted to separate warm or cool palettes. Flashback sequences wherein the scientist is a shy and humble young man, and later scenes of defeat are predominantly colored with cooler hues. Following his romantic rejection, he becomes obsessed with achievement and conquest, and those panels are dominated by red, orange, and yellow. The glow of screens, lights, and the moon appear throughout in yellow halftones. In addition, there are several instances of carefully repeated imagery in the comic. To literally, to literally wrap the project, and in order to, prevent, to present the story in its intended comic book form, which you can see on paper right here, Gib and I reconvene for cover art. The front cover features an unrelated story, as if Blow Up the Moon is merely one story in an anthology comic. The rendering style is heavily influenced by Neil Adams and other 1970s horror comic covers. Depicting a lone librarian face, facing an angry and willfully ignorant mob, the cover responds to Republican efforts to restrict access to books and discussion of subjects that they consider objectionable. The back cover lampoons vintage BB gun advertisements in light of contemporary gun violence. Inspired by a prompt for serial art, I developed this experimental graphic narrative. There's not as much to the core art making process in this piece, but that's part of uh, what makes it stand out from my other work. With nearly all of my projects, I spend hours collecting and analyzing reference material and I pour over every detail. Often I will refine that work until I run out of time to continue. The Magnet comic was a very different situation. While I constructed the final piece from a variety of materials, I set st fairly strict limits for myself at the outset. I restrained my palette to black and white 
and I wanted to limit the amount of time that I spent on it. After jotting down some ideas for an assortment of panels, I roughly sketched the strongest concepts on watercolor paper, quickly painting over those sketches with India ink. To set a dark and somewhat mysterious mood, I used only one brush and applied heavy shadows with no additional values. And you can see here an early example I printed on my home printer and uh, miniature magnet board. I tried to recall familiar comics without actually looking at them, including works by Will Eisner, Frank Miller, and especially David Mazzuccelli's work on Batman Year One. I avoided typical comic book inking methods, and the resulting panels rely largely on contrast and negative space rather than line to create form. The result is an untitled comic that allows the reader to manipulate a wordless, noir-like story by reordering, omitting, and rotating individual panels. The 15 panels are printed on magnetic paper and presented on the magnetic board. Most of the panels are contrived to have multiple common interpretations. A fist appears to be clenched in anger or knocking on a door, while another hand is curled in threat, exhaustion, or death. Lips close in for a kiss or a whisper, and a cork exploding from a bottle suggests celebration, ecstasy, or a gunshot. The comic bridges interactivity and seriality, and this narrative requires audience participation. This is a pur purposeful contrast between the intimacy of its images and the scale of its presentation. The wall-mounted presentation and interactivity also defy the typically solitary experience of comic reading. On a personal level, the creation process led me to critically assess my, assess my compositions for narrative clarity or purposeful obscurity, and to attempt more challenging panel designs. I think of my art making kind of like unfolding a map and that I'm exploring different forms and materials and I keep finding something adjacent and moving out from there and trying different things. I'm gonna keep acquiring new perspectives and serving new clients and audiences and making work for my own personal satisfaction. I expect to continue experimenting with graphic narrative as well. And with that, I thank you again for your time and I hope that I was able to share a little bit of the joy that I experienced in making this work. Committee question time. Um, more new art, <laughs> working in different styles, new materials. Um, I want to try maybe a little bit longer graphic narrative and some different styles with that graphic narrative. I think I'm going to do some things that are in the traditional like panels on paper, but in a different rendering styles, maybe something that's a little more serious in tone. Um, I've always liked sculpture and I think I, I showed one little picture of a sculpture I've done. So I'd like to do some more sculpture, mold making, casting. Um, I've got another like uh, blow mold light up image in the back of my mind <laughs> I'd like to do as well. Um, I'm sure that I must be. Uh, a lot of professional work, of course, you know, um, UCF celebrates the arts. <laughs> yeah, yes. I did, I did <laughs> put like, you know, 70% of my Christmas card was done this year and it got tabled. But so we're just hoping the kids don't look too different next year. So I can just finish that painting out, right? So I was, <laughs> a little spoiler alert, I was doing something that's inspired by um, Rockwell's paintings on uh, Saturday Evening Post. So <laughs> look for that in December 2024. I'm up. <laughs> so one of the things I've always been impressed by your work is like the, the variety of style and the kind of breadth of, of, uh, of what you can do. And it seems like most of them, if not all of them, are like deceptively straightforward in the sense that you're looking at, I'm looking at, well, you just passed by the, the DeSantis one that was just mm -hmm. crazy, um, where you can kind of look at it and feel like, oh, it's just a straightforward kind of illustration, Mickey Mouse mm -hmm. because he wants to straight some fun. So, but then when you look at it deeper, you realize that you have these interpretations of like, it's meant to be like a cell, celluloid uh -huh. and all that stuff. So I'm curious about at what point does that concept or those elements of, of, the, uh, of the images appear in your process? It, it's really important to me. I mean, every once in a while I might land on a visual gag that I feel so strong, I just need to do it. And then if time allows, I know I'm gonna build something deeper into it. But usually I'm thinking about the sort of the thematic presentation and what's unique about it that separates it from a traditional political cartoon in this case. And I, you know, I wanted that sort of zany um, <laughs> situation there. And in this case, you know, it was all about the, um, the symbol and the, the burning Confederate flag. I do a lot of pieces where, like in this case, 
where there's something there that you should grab at a moment's glance and all that we need to share is like a basic, you know, culture. You, you live in the West, you know what Donald Trump looks like. Most of that is there for you. And if you take the time to think about what that represents, then I've got the, the saying, cut off your nose to spite your face and what it represents, you know, in the greater picture, right? And uh, Chuck advised me to include one of my pieces. I should have included it here, it turns out. <laughs> I did, um, I did uh, a superhero piece where they're all on the beach and it's meant to be, you know, all you need to know is an, this looks like an old comic book. And there's, it's in your, in your collage. is it? Yeah, I have like <laughs> one, one tiny picture of it. So you won't see the whole picture. But so Superman there, I rendered it, you know, in the vintage comic style. And I don't expect that everyone will necessarily connect that with Clark Clint and Super, Superman. I think there's a fairly good chance in this place, time and place that people will get that. Um, and then if they happen to be more into comic book nerdery, <laughs> then there are plenty of other little Easter eggs in there um, that are very specific to classic comic books and the characters themselves. And that's how I approach a lot of my pieces is that there's this initial impact, everyone should get it, it should be engaging, and, and then there's this next layer down and sometimes even further, you know, that if you have that knowledge, you can appreciate more about it. Um, I feel that it's important because, number one, I think I mentioned the, the attention to detail. The fact that when you were using real materials and you're having to do so much by hand, the time it takes, the expense you're using to generate that final product, that you want to get it right the first time if you can, and you want to limit those mistakes, and so you're looking very carefully at every element. And that's really integral when you're literally laying out a magazine article like blocks of text at a time and paste, literal paste up. And then you take it off into the um, dark room and you take pictures of it. And every step of this adds time to your process. So you want to get it right the first time. So I was learning those things really early on. I was working for my mom's business sometimes in the late hours, you know. And um, also, just in the act of creating those pieces by hand, I'm thinking more about the compositional balance and gutters, the negative space became really important. And I'm sure you can pick these up digitally, but something about that physical experience made that more intense. I was paying more attention to that. Right. And it does seem like in your presentation that now you actually sometimes begin digitally. Mm -hmm. would, that, would that be? Yeah, I would say that more and more I'll end up sketching the pencils the digi on digitally, you know, but I still do a lot of paper. It just depends on a lot, like what the timeline is like and where I'm at, where I'm sitting when I need to start. You know, I, I prefer still the touch of pencil on paper. Um, if I know I've got a little more time, then, I, then I'm looking for paper. And I can have, you know, I can do it, I can erase and I can draw it several times. If I'm in a real hurry, or if I'm just not in a place where it's as easy to work with the physical media, then I'll, I'll go straight to digital. And some, you know, I've done some inversions where I've done the sketch on digitally. Uh, well, actually, we looked at some of that with the um, show, the um, Blow Up the Moon comic, where I did some of the inks traditionally. So in this case, um, I did the thumbnails in newsprint. I took them into the computer and I did the pencils, the tighter pencils on the iPad. And then I printed them out in light blue and I inked them traditionally on for half of the pages. And so there, there's other instances like that as well. Like I think I mentioned with the, the light box that there was this, I composited photos of my family. I drew, drew them by uh, blue pencil, I think. And then I scanned them in and then I printed out in light blue on arches paper. And I drew in like technical pens and ink wash on the arches paper. I photographed that, I bring that back in the computer, I color it digitally and it gets printed on transparency, and then there's the physical process of building that frame around it. So I really enjoy that kind of like back and forth. It keeps it, excuse me, energized. Are there some um, new digital projects that products that are out that are you're excited about? Um, or how has that changed, I guess, you know, uh, like what you're able to do digitally? Right, like with the John Prine piece, I mean, it's almost indistinguishable from traditional media. I mean, it probably is if you were to find the right paper to print it out on. I don't know if you would be able to tell that it was digital. So like these brushes and these digital textures become so convincing that it's, um, it, you know, sometimes you're like, ah, I don't, I don't want to mess up too much. I'm going to go straight to the computer, you know, if there's a tight timeline on it. So that's been really, really handy. 
And you know, I've, I, I think of sculpture, the little bit that I've done is sort of an escape for me from digital, but I do at one point want to pick up the, the 3D modeling tools. The football player in the bottom, that's traditional. Right? Yeah, it is. So that one, um, I found a couple of vintage photographs of football players from the 1940s. There's of Kenny Washington, a famous player for the Rams, and then another guy who I don't recall who it was. I took like the head from one and the body from another, and I think in that case I'd printed them out on paper and I was just drawing straight to the board. And then I added glasses because I wanted it to be a little bit nerdy because it was for a jazz album cover. Um, so, and then I just started with, I think, watercolor, light watercolor, and some marker for the body itself, and there's a tiny bit of gouache in there as well. And then I took it back in the computer, and then I added a lot of fake weathering effects for the album cover. So you get like the, the wear pattern of vinyl on the front of this compact disc and the digital version of it. And then the back of it was done to look like a vintage Topps baseball card with a little inset cartoon. And the track listing looked like the statistics from a player's you know, like baseball card. And the inside, I had like a letter jacket, like the, what do you call it, the stitched that with little jazz. What is yeah, the varsity jacket letter with like, um, you know, bronze looking little pins for the different jazz instruments. So there was just layer after layer of different things that referenced vintage sports fandom, right? You feel, sorry, just so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so each, each one of your pieces seems to have a strong concept and, and um, its own story, but do you feel like when you look at your, overarching scope of work, do you feel like you have a theme that could be in each of your stories, whether it's political, familiar, um, or is there like one thing that I might be done and this is what I say with my work? Well, I mean, you, you do hit on that, that I have these themes that I return to, family, politics, religious critique, um, pop culture figures that I'm interested in or that I get uh, commissioned to render, you know. Um, humor is probably the most common thread. It's not in everything, but it's in the vast majority, so. Um, up here, it's probably that one, and not just for the well, presence of my, you know. That was the <laughs> my my youngest isn't in it, and she hasn't really like gotten to the point where she's upset that she's not in it. But at some point, <laughs> at some point, I might have to have a paired piece that's just her, you know. <laughs> Gosh, I, it could be any of them. It depends on how much time you've been given to do the project, I think, you know. Like, I, I'll find a way to get engaged in it and to make it my own if there's enough time in, in the production schedule. I guess we can move on to other questions. I have a slide for that. <laughs> Okay. I love the way you collect the pieces. Put together, printed, reshaped, printed, which one take. It was just printed digitally, but because I limited the color palette within um, Procreate and Photoshop to those CMYK values, then it comes out pretty convincing. Some fake paper, well, actual scanned paper textures put on top, you know. And you know, you do some things to fade the black ink. In fact, I could have pushed it more to make it look actually more vintage. In the end, I left it a little bit more saturated just for effect. But there was that part of me that wanted to weather it a lot till it looked like, you know, genuine 70s printing, you know, that had been sitting in your attic for <laughs> 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And that's kind of a follow-up. Tell us a little bit more about your collaboration. It seems like a very successful piece. The editorial. Yeah, and just like Chuck asked where I feel more comfortable, there are plenty of times where I have a, a client or a collaborator that we just get along really well, or there, again, there's a lot of time and they're understanding and they're interested in having bouncing ideas back and forth. In this case, Gib and I have a shared sense of humor, <laughs> and he grew up on some of the same comic books and things, and so he knew right away what it was I was trying to get at, and I was able to do almost the entire comic with no changes. I think I, we changed some of the flash, flashback elements you know, based on his feedback. Um, and it just, you know, those similar approach um, without even having to try too hard, it worked really well in this case, you know, uh, but having an understanding collaborator is integral. Did he write it and then you 
He did. And I'm trying to remember whether he wrote it before I started it or not. I can't remember if it was an existing idea. I know that he hadn't fully scripted it. But you know, I, I talked to him about doing a comic together. And he presented the script. And then I was just, you know, you could look sort of like a, a skeleton of a film script, you know. And then I penciled it out in my thumbnails and showed him those before we got any further. And so I guess in that process, then you kind of decide which words are going to go on each. Right, exactly. He, well, actually, he does, you know, grid out in panels. There were some changes I made. I said, I'm going to combine these, or I'm going to split these across three. I'm going to, I made some of the decisions as to where the page breaks happened. And then sometimes we came back and um, altered that a little bit. But it, it was pretty tight script, I would say. Um, and then I, I provided all the, pretty much all the visual cues that I added. We talked about um, some of the specific comic book references. This is a very particular panel from the origin of Batman that people like me would gather. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know if any of the other references are very specific, but obviously the, the style and you know, sort of the dramatic poses will be very familiar to fans of classic comics. And then the cover, um, it was another situation where after the fact I came to him and I said, got an idea for a cover? <laughs> and then he, he scripted all the dialogue for it and then I found ways to sort of um, balance all that dialogue because you wouldn't typically see that many characters speaking on a cover at the same time. Um, and there was just a little bit of back and forth to try to improve it. But uh, it was a very painless process. Do you engage in, uh, do you read any kind of the critical literature of like art historians and visual culture people who write about comics and these periods of comics? And I, I don't actually. <laughs> Right. You know, Scott McCloud, Understanding Comics, of course, I've, I've read that. Um, there might be some other, you know, a little bit more broad audience commercial books about the form that I've read, but I haven't read any of the really critical literature, the academic stuff. Any recommendations? I'll happily accept them later. I actually don't have a lot of ambition for that. I'm mean, always open to it. <laughs> yeah. I think it would be fun to be part of a comics related exhibition or political cartoons or maybe portraiture to you know grab one of those themes within the work and be a part of it. Uh, when we started thinking about what this would look like, um, I thought, well, maybe it'll just be a salon style thing of just 30 works all put together closely and intentionally um, mismatched, you know, but like having an interesting um, array of colors and so forth, a, a rhythm to it. And I think that would have been pretty cool, but I, ultimately this worked a little bit better in the that we've got this sort of a little bit of a color progression and then subject progression and then comics and background of comics and just by chance Olivia's work has this nice horizontal like feel that balances what I'm doing over here that came out pretty nice. So it's the election year. Uh, <sighs> Not yet. I mean, there were probably, for every one I did, I probably had four or five or six other ideas, and it's just, it is exhausting, and I, I do value the joy in the process, so I have to be in the right space where I think the idea is good enough where I'm just, you know, <laughs> mentally ready to tackle that, but I had some other DeSantis cartoons and, that I would have liked to have done, um, and uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll hope it's less crazy than we know it's going to be, and I won't be motivated at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if it were a client project, that would be different, of course. You know, I'd, I'd find that way to get it done, so. Just to piggyback off of that, I feel like, well, I'm asking, is your political work kind of like reactive? It's not like something where you have this preconceived, oh, the election's coming, I'm going to make this work. It's like January 6th happened. Right. This idea, um, from that Yeah, happened? I think it's pretty much all been reactive, you know, the, um, that was obviously after Charlottesville and some other incidents um, and the Reedy Creek case and DeSantis's uh, instance. Um, I mean, like the Jesus, Jesus realty looking piece, you know, that was, that was more of an accident. And then I gave a little plastic figure 
well, actually, it involves two people in this room, <laughs> that uh, my wife's mother, grandmother passed, and we went down to clear out her, her uh, possessions. I actually never got a chance to meet her, and I found this little Jesus carrying the cross figurine, and Victor here had a um, display in his office that was full of superheroes and other pop culture characters and little plastic figurines, and I said, well, he needs Jesus. He's got to have him among the superheroes. So I brought that back, and, uh, and then he, he, he still has it. It's in my office. <laughs> he not, it somehow got knocked off the shelf, and it broke the end of the cross off, and I was like, oh, well, it looks like he's carrying either a mailbox post or a realty sign. And so that kicked off the idea of, you know, um, prosperity gospel and um, the housing crisis. It just all sort of dovetailed by accident and made a really nice image. I just keep doing interesting artwork anywhere I can, you know, getting satisfaction of, out of the client work and the personal work. Um, I think, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely teach here and there. Whether I'll do it full time or not, I'm not sure, but um, I, do, I do enjoy engaging with the students, just the younger artists with the different like platforms and the different media. You, know, you can always learn a lot from what they're being exposed to and how they work and how their mind approaches some of the same problems. It it can be yeah I, I pretty much know early in the process whether I'm going for a really sh like replica you know, and a full on homage uh, or whether it's more just a, a reference and so if either way I'm going to pull a lot of reference material in most cases and just pour over it before I do the work in other cases I'm like you say I'm really trying to avoid looking too much like this person or this specific work and so it's just there in the back of my mind and I'm not looking at it directly so. I think it's probably joy and humor, like experiencing that in the work and for that to be present in the end product for the audience. That's really important to me. Well, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>